So uh, thank you so much, uh, Arun, for the introduction. And thank you, Jasper and Abdullah, for setting this wonderful conference. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to sort of come first and, and then start the proceedings for the day. Uh, I'd just like to make one small correction. I'm not heading the business in Asia, but I'm heading a marketing for what we call our Emerging Asia Business Unit, which is the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia. So it's a cluster of 11 markets where the business size today is still very small. And we hope to sort of bring there more some of the love that I was uh, you know, getting from some of the people who were saying how they've grown up with the brand in, in, in European markets. So, uh, yeah. I think, uh, uh, so just to basically sort of quickly introduce myself, I've been in Singapore for about 10 years, uh, and when I came here 10 years ago, uh, I started working with P&G, Procter & Gamble, and they put me on Pringles. As a young bachelor, it was the perfect brand, because you know, once you pop the fun can't stop, always go to parties with Pringles, and it was the nicest brand to work on. Then I was about to get married, then they put me on the laundry business. So, uh, you know, imagine a guy who loves to do laundry, and you know, thankfully my wife liked it, and so, you know, we, we got married. And, uh, and uh, we, I worked in the laundry business for about, five, for about five years, and then it was time to have a kid, so I moved to Lego. So, <laughs> so in a way, all the experiences that I will share will probably be limited to these categories, which is snacks, laundry, and Lego toys, and then some external examples. So, so with that, uh, let me begin. Uh, we'll just probably uh, talk a bit about how can we leverage data to come up with insights, and then second, how to take those to make them to like a bit more tangible business models, from trial models, and then finally some case from Lego, which hopefully brings it all together for, for, you, for us. So uh, first point, uh, you know, data is a friend, right? Probably one of our best friends. And I know there has been a lot of discussion recently because of the GDPR and people are having a headache on how do we manage this, and it's first party, the third party, and there's a lot of anxiety about how do we do it, how do we deal, and how do we move forward with this. But urgent, uh, my honest plea would be that if we treat it as a friend and consider how it can help drive our business, that's probably the way to go. You know, if we refer to a McKinsey research, it states that companies who, uh, you know, that leverage uh, customer behavior data to generate, uh, or to generate insights, uh, typically have 85% more revenue than the peer group, and 25% more profits. So this is something that we should, ensure that uh, is followed in our companies. And the kind of places for which we can use data are many for, right, whether it be consumer acquisition, be it upselling to the same consumer, or be it, uh, you know, ensuring that consumers retain retention. We all know, you know, people who bought this on Amazon also bought this, and all of us have seen that, and click, click, then inadvertently got that to purchase. That was, something like that was almost inconceivable 10 years ago. So, those, those things, uh, you know, how do we basically embrace them and, and work towards them so that we may make sure that our business follow? I think that's critical, that's critical. Uh, second point, uh, which I would like to highlight is, this is just a quote from one of my favorite business leaders, Lau Gerson, who turned around IBM, and it's, it's one of the best sellers, about, still about 10, 20 years old, but kind of timeless. And what he says is that good strategies start with massive amounts of quantitative analysis, and then, you know, it's just blended with wisdom, insight, and risk-taking, but the key point is, uh, quantitative analysis, which is hard. You know, based on my experience, a lot of times the inside work or the analysis work is given to the business intelligence team, market research team, who follow a simple template and fill it on a monthly basis or quarterly basis and send it to the business. That should not how the analysis piece should work. The business and the market research team should be sitting together and working on what are the key questions, what is working, is that there a particular geography where business is not doing well? Is there a particular price point where business has skyrocketed? And understand the reasons why before we get to that template. So, uh, so the plea would be to work closely, hand in hand, and embrace this. Just like to play one video to bring about the power of data. In 2016, a nationwide survey found that one in five students struggles with access to clean clothes for school. This leads to thousands of students skipping school each day, contributing to a U.S. dropout rate of more than 4,000 students every day. Kids who drop out have a 40% higher unemployment rate, a 70% higher welfare rate, and are eight times more likely to go to prison. For any educator, you're aware that access to clean clothes can be a problem. It's what you didn't realize was the magnitude of the issue. With such compelling data, Whirlpool launched the Care Counts program to see if attendance rates would improve when students have access to clean clothes. 
We installed washers and dryers into at-risk schools across the country. And we built custom data collection devices and installed them on each of the washers at each of the schools. So before each wash, a student ID was entered into the device. And this data let us see the actual connection between a student having clean clothes and its impact on their attendance. Since the program has been in the school, my attendance is consistent. The goal is 90, we have over 90 percent all the time. After a full year of data collection, we found that over 90 percent of students in the program improved their attendance. And the highest risk students were in school an additional two weeks more than the previous year. Beyond attendance, the program also impacted students socially and academically, with 89 percent increasing their class participation and 95 percent engaging in more extracurricular activities. They went from kind of being embarrassed to this confidence level of, hey, look at me, Ruth. If one story is going to stick in your brain today, I think it could be this one. Whirlpool. 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 It, it may seem a bit unusual, a washer dryer leading to student success, but staff here say they've seen it work. So uh, this won the Creative Grand Prix Award in Cannes last year. Uh, and again, this just to highlight, this is the power of data. Because as you notice, the first person saying, we never understood the magnitude of the problem. And it's like crazy to think, how can a washer and dryer lead to more school attendance? But that's what the case was. So again, just highlighting the power of data. OK, so uh, quiz time. Anybody can guess who this is? Gets 100 points. And with those 100 points, you get a free visit to the Lego office, which is one of the best offices in Singapore. Yes, spot on. This is the much talked about Amazon flywheel. Uh, so I don't want to go into the details because all of us, uh, you know, there's enough and more material uh, on it, on how this works. But just to bring home the point, uh, the statement at the bottom, which is it was Bezos, re you know, found stumbling upon this fact that the web traffic grew by 230,000% in one year that made him recognize the power of the internet and made him almost want to do something entrepreneurial in, in this space. So again, since the conference theme is around that, so just want to bring home the point about the importance of insight and importance of data. And who knows, you know, if he wouldn't have seen that data, maybe we wouldn't have had Amazon something else, but it might have been a totally different world. So, uh, so that's that. At the same time, uh, just want to also say that data might not always be sufficient and the learning that you can get, get out of even talking to one consumer, a deep dive even one, with one consumer might lead to insights which you know data can never deliver. And I uh, just like to share a personal example here. When I was working on the laundry business in India, we were doing IHVs, the in-home visits, and uh, we sort of met, 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 met a woman who was talking about her experience when she wears clean clothes, stain free, looking like new. And what she said was, when I go outside, people treat me with respect. I go in a bus, people give up. If people get up and give up their seat for me. People refer to me as Madam G, Madam G. So you know, in Hindi, that's like a term for, you know, since you're treating somebody with somebody's respect. That really brought home the point about why. You know, we always knew that, yes, consumers are wanting clean clothes, stain free clothes, but this was really the so what of it. That really enhances the status in the society and why which a third person sees her. So that led us to clean what we, uh, to create what we call the clean like new or the shine like new campaign, where the whole idea was that, you know, the detergent aerial can keep your clothes clean like new, or in Hindi as we call chamak rakhe nai jaisi, which means like shine like new. So, uh, and then there were obviously multiple pillars around it on package, product, PR, uh, so multiple pillars on which we worked and delivered the campaign, but the, the home, the central place from where it started was that woman. It was more than six years ago, but I can distinctly remember the setting of the home, her words, and that really created an impact. So uh, with that, we can maybe go to the second section, which is how can we use this to sort of create uh, some uh, meaningful changes in the business. So, uh, but before, before I go there, also would like to share that uh, it's not always uh, that you know we, you you get get to uh, have you get to stumble on an insight, and I think all of us know here how companies work, right? We all know when you get an idea, you take it to 
your in-house team, you ask for approvals, you take it to the research and development, they will work on a product, then you work the financial model, have marketing and sales work on it, create a go-to-market plan, and so on and so forth. So the intent is not to talk about the process, because I'm sure all of us are aware of it, but intent is to share some couple of nuggets which I thought really will differentiate what will be a good execution from a great execution. Uh, so with that intent, I want to share a few points. First point about being bold and being candid. Uh, you know, Jack Wells says in, in his book that this is the number one dirty little secret in business that people are not candid enough. And uh, this was true for me. Uh, in my first few years, you know, when we were, when we would go uh, to a big to a big meeting with a general manager or vice president, if there is a sort of a certain way to pull the business forward and certain decisions, we would tend to stay quiet. You know, who wants to raise your voice and disrupt and, and be uh, you know, like, and, and create create confusion or chaos. Uh, but what I realized was that in the you are the cl person who's closest to the data. Uh, the person who is the, on the ground is the closest to the data, closest to the real insights. And often, pe and, and the farther the organization is from the ground, the farther is are they from reality, more often than not. And it's, you know, it, it's really up to us, up to you to, to share what you think, if it's obviously based on a, on a reasonably certain data or an insight that you have. And the case I would like to bring here to talk about here is our brand launch in Vietnam. So Vietnam was a very tough market for laundry business for PNG because Unilever owned 80% of the market. The brand Omo was a love mark with more than 80% share, and uh, it was almost like a lion's den. And we've been we were trying to get into the market for many years, but not, but but never were able to create uh, a sustainable plan to do that. And I was working on this project to do it after almost multiple iterations. We were in this final review with the vice president, and then. Uh, there was a decision whether we, you know, go in with a with a loss or do we change like jack up pricing? And based on our insight, we knew that if we take up pricing, if we go more expensive than Omo, we will never succeed. And that was my first instance when I really literally put the job on the line and said, if it's going to be more than more pricing, then we should not launch. And I cannot work on this project, and the team cannot work on this project. So really putting your whole equity on the line, and and that really then. Uh, uh, really, you know, basically made the made the general management feel differently about it as well, and then they had uh, they, they changed the direction, and we eventually did not take up the pricing. We launched it with with what was parity pricing, and then it's a, it's a successful launch in, launch in the market now. Still, Omo owns uh, more than seventy percent of the share, but at least we are making some headway. So, key point: be candid, say what you feel, if it's obviously based on some quantitative or qualitative data. Next point here is another quiz question. This is the share price of a, a firm in the US. And again, 100 points to somebody who can guess what this is. Might not be super clear from, from the distance. So let me share. It's uh, starting from 1988. And there's a peak in 99 when there's a, when there was a dot com boom and bust. And then in the last four years, it's really skyrocketed. Oh, it's not Apple. Close to uh, close to hundred now. It's 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 not the Google and the Facebooks. It's not Google and Facebook. It's but it's still in the tech space. So a tech sp a firm in the tech space is doing really well, but started before 1988. Any more guesses? Microsoft. Yes, Microsoft. There you go. So Microsoft had this uh, awesome, uh, almost I would say reinvention behind Satya Nadella, right? And there you see Microsoft Corporation. And again, the point here is uh, how to be bold and challenging the status quo. He came in and really turned, changed the way the company used to think. You know, while I was growing up, I, was, I did my, engin my engineering, and on campus, you would always tend to love Linux, the open source software provider, because they are the good people, and Microsoft was always the evil, you know, charging money for Windows, and you know. and then after he took over the CEO role, he goes up on stage one year after, and the slide says Microsoft loves Linux. I mean, path-breaking stuff. So it's this partnership with competitors, Linux, Apple now now you see the Microsoft Office on the uh, you know on the Android phones in the App Store it's all partnering with what were previous competitors 
uh, to deliver what is the right thing for the consumers. So again, and, and again, if you, if you see his book, uh, hit refresh, I must recommend if you're looking to read something in the summer, uh, he quotes these examples and then he says that he faced a lot of internal challenge within Microsoft, people people say, hey, how can this really proceed? But uh, he braved through them and, and, and then kind of went ahead with this. So again, how can we bold and challenge the status quo? And then the third, sorry, yeah. I'm missing a slide in between, the key message was, uh, how can we be bold and think big goals? So maybe you can see this video and then I'll explain what this is about. Would we increase the volume as well, please? Yeah. So yeah, if what this was, this was what we called a Lego piece of piece in a World Heritage art, art exhibition happened last year in Singapore. And uh, this, is made of, this is made of Lego bricks, about half a million Lego bricks led to us to create these 30, 35 UNESCO World Heritage monuments all with, all with bricks. Uh, the key point was, it was, it was incredibly difficult to get this to Singapore because we had a lot of time constraints, financial constraints, but our GM said, no, we have to make it work, we have to make it happen, and you know, let's see what, what it takes to, to get it done. And that was his uh, sort of uh, you know, push to us in the sense of put, putting the high bars and making sure that we are enabling us in a way that we could make it work. And then we over-delivered on all our KPIs of PR, uh, you know, sales, and then traffic, and so on and so forth. So a key message here over here is, how can we set high goals for, uh, for ourselves? Not every time, but for a few projects that we believe can make a difference. And maybe sometimes we don't deliver, but some of the time that we deliver, we really make an impact and, and create a transformation. So those three points in totality, which is being bold about, uh, you know, as we saw in the first example, speaking up your mind, being candid. <laughs> and second example, about changing the status quo. And third example of setting high goals is what I would leave with you in terms of, you know, thinking about this new world of where everything is, is being disrupted and how you can stand out, make your company stand out. Uh, the last piece that I would like to share is uh, what I read in a book called uh, Catalyst by Mondley's, uh, you know, senior executive, his name is Chandramoli Venkatesan. Uh, what he was sharing was a TMRR framework. Again, something which is very straightforward and all of us know this concept, but just want to uh, reinforce one, po one point. What he's saying is that every project that we do, we start off with putting a target, measuring it, reviewing it, and then reflecting on it. And often what happens is that if a project fails, then we sit in a room and say, what happened? Why did it not work? But if a project succeeds, then we don't do that. We don't learn from our successes as much as we learn from our failures. Why is that? Can we change that? Can we make sure that reflection is a key part of every process of every project that we do? Because that really helps us improve going forward. And again, as market research people uh, working on client side or agency side, that is something which we, which we should really reinforce. We owe it to ourselves to, 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 to do that, to make sure that we get better over time. Uh, one example again from here, on my Pringles days, uh, we had this insight that the sound of the chip crunch that you see there really tingles the mind and it creates, uh, uh, you know, the, it basically leads to your mouth water and then you would want to have the chip. So that was the insight. And with that, we put this visual in-store as a, as a visual for communication, but also we said, let's sample in-store. So we did in-store sampling tests in Singapore, in our NTUCs and cold storage markets, uh, with, the hoping, with hoping that it will lead to conversion and great, great trial. But it did not work. It did not work because, one, the conversion wasn't as good, we were hoping, but there was nothing to compare for the shopper. And so immediately when you give something to them to taste, it was, yeah, it's okay, but not strong enough for me to buy it right then. So there was no, our learning was that 
on on itself it doesn't deliver had we had some comparison maybe it could have secondly the store traffic only only it made it made this viable in a very small number of stores and when you scale it up it's not meaningful for a market like singapore or bangkok so uh, what we what about the learning of which we these two learnings a couple of years later when i was working on the aerial india business then we took this model to a door to door sampling and there we there we took the uh, took these learning and we did a side by side comparison so we had a wash with aerial and wash with another detergent and you can clearly see the difference in stain removal capability as an example and we optimize the cost in a way that we would only go uh, to to markets with big uh, with big coverage so key message is failure is good because you learn from it uh, and then as long as you learn from it and then and then bring that learning in the next iteration it's it's all good and again these visuals below as are saying that while in store communication is still on this but the sampling did not did not work so that's just uh, one learning to take home so uh, that's uh, primarily it from uh, the second section and third i would just like to bring everything together by sharing one example from lego so in lego i mean we have had an amazing period of growth since 2003 when the company was about to about to go bankrupt and uh, and, and and but last year we had sort of some headwinds in our growth and then we, as we as we understood why that's the case we found out that kids play patterns are changing they want more first person play and they want physical digital integration i mean how many of us have kids here who are always glued to their phones right so uh, so so that's why we wanted to do something about that so for the first we we were able to work with our design teams and then launch what we what we called the ninjago spinjitsu which is basically first person play kids are while after after they build the spinner they are the ones who are building it in so many different ways you can make it jump you can make it wheel around you can make it orbit you can spin it on your farm you are the hero and another that that we launched was uh, what we call lego boost so if you could play this video obviously thank you lego boost is a completely new kind of lego experience of course there are brick 144 of them plus three new boost bricks and yes there are fun models to build five different ones to start but the completely new thing about Lego Boost is how it combines all the best of Lego building with all the modern technology we know kids love today. Once they get the box, they download the free app and they're good to go. They simply choose what model they want, find the digital building instructions in the app, and start building. Then, with a flick of a finger, they can create a string of commands that will bring their creation to life. Turn left, swing right, move straight ahead, or twist and reverse, shoot, shout, or purr like a cat. The coding blocks are icon based, so they're easy to understand. And most importantly, if it all goes wrong, you simply scratch the code and start again. Nothing to worry about. There are over 60 activities linked to the five different models and a play map to help them along the way. Once they're finished with the cool robot, friendly cat, or multi-tooled rover, they can rebuild it into a mini robot builder or a cool rock guitar. The funniest thing with Lego Boost is that the kids are learning to code without even thinking about it. So again, this type of stuff, stuff takes years, but again, based on the insight that it's actually the digital physical play that we really need to do, and having both elements together, uh, the team in Balloon came up with this concept, tested it, there were multiple rounds of learning, and then after, uh, after learning and making some hard choices, this eventually was launched. This was launched last year, and again, going back to the TMRR framework, the launch was good, uh, but there were some opportunities. What we learned was that kids, once they built the robo, He's called Vani. Once, once the once kids built Vani the robot, they fell in love with him. They didn't want to break it and make the cat. So here we have a five-in-one model, but kids are not really willing to use it as a five-in-one. So now what we are trying to do is making sure, okay, if you love Vani, what are the ten different things you can do with Vani the robot? Or if you've already built Frankie the cat, how can you just play with Frankie the cat? So again, successful launch, but we, the full full opportunity is not yet being. Uh, be being materialized. So again, we are just going back to our learning process and seeing how can we bring this bring this further. So that's pretty much it uh, that I had to share. Uh, in summary, I would say 
uh, if we can learn to leverage data quantitatively, but also the insights that come from one-on-one -on -one interactions, that would be great. Uh, second point, be bold. We owe it, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your company. Be bold. Uh, and lastly, please make sure that you know there's a constant uh, cycle of learning. Most important of that being to reflect. Yeah, that's all I had to share. I would just like to end with this quote, which I found in the book from Phil Knight, Nike's founder. He quotes Douglas MacArthur, the US Army general. You are remembered for the rules you break. Kind of going back to the be bold point, a lot of times we have rules. You can't do this, you can't do that. In Lego, we have a rule, you can't put this figure with this figure. And often we say, why? So, okay to break. Go and ask for forgiveness later. Thank you. Uh, Rohan, I think we have time for a few questions. Sure. So, if you can just hold on. Firstly, uh, I, I really enjoy this, uh, you know, the, what you shared. A lot of notes. Number one, buy Microsoft stock. Number two, I think uh, next thing I'll do tomorrow is buy a spinjitsu. Yeah, but uh, you know, a lot of a lot of great takeaways. Uh, uh, I really loved the whirlpool example because it is so obvious. It is right in front of us the correlation between you know, dirty clothes and how it impacts uh, you know, impacts the student. And you know, the insight is out there. We just need to look for it. Yeah? It's, it's a great piece, a great great piece of work. So let's open the floor to questions. And if someone, whoever has the cube, can pass it to whoever raises hands. So guys, great opportunity to get some more insights from Rohan. Any questions on the floor? It's a valid question if you say if you want to come to a LEGO office or want to get discounts on LEGO products. You can entertain that as well. Yeah, no, I've noted that one. <laughs> so uh, maybe, maybe let me ask one question, uh, uh, Rohan. So LEGO as a brand is known for, it, it's an inspiring brand. It's known for creativity. So it'll be great to hear your thoughts on how you bring that ethos of creativity into the marketing and insight function and, and how you operate. So if you can just share a few thoughts on that. Yeah. I think it's a great question because in Asia, people haven't grown up with Lego. You, know, you, you, you talk to anybody who spent their initial years in, in, in America, North America or Europe, and they would love the brand. But here, kids don't know much about it. I mean, leave about Singapore, but if you talk about other emerging markets, even the parents don't know about it. Why should I pay? And it's an expensive brand. Let's accept it. Why should I pay so much more to get this? So it's ex it was extremely critical for us to establish that, the power of creativity. Uh, and uh, we are just looking at ways to bring this forward. Now, in the last few years, we have done, uh, done, done work to kind of bring it out. One example, uh, we engaged, uh, just to show the, the power of creativity, we engaged uh, uh, you know, a play group of kids. And uh, you know, we, we, asked a, we asked a group of a bunch of kids to come and just build what they like. And they ended up building, you know, kids, are imag their imagination is key, right? This is, this is high. They built like this candy, uh, candy cloud. This is a cloud which can fly and it can shower candies on their kids if they're sad, on their friends, right? And then we engaged a group of polytechnic students in Singapore who actually built that thing. They actually built a, built a cloud which can actually fly and it can shower candy. And then we brought the kids with their parents to that room and, to, and, and showed them. And, and that video is priceless. I mean, I can send it to Abdullah after the conference and request all of you to see it. The reaction on the kids and the parents' kids is priceless. So it's this power of creativity and imagination that we want to establish, and we do things like these to sort of is to bring it back. There are more examples I can talk about, uh, but uh, yeah, just to bring this point. Uh, hi, yeah, hi, Rohan. Um, it's me again, Simon. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, in a, the APAC region, which which region do you think would is the hardest for Lego? Uh, to have impact in uh, out of all the regions within the APAC uh, district, which is the yeah. hardest area for you? Yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a mixed bag because there are markets like Japan, which, which is like the second biggest toy market in the world. It's extremely competitive with, uh, with, with Tomi Takara and, uh, uh, and Bandai having bulk of the share of the market. So there the challenges are different, where it's more competitive play. Uh, but you know we have these emerging markets, you know places like India and Indonesia, with huge number of kids. Uh, but just the affordability is is a challenge. So I think the I would say these two markets are probably the most challenging, for either from a competitive landscape or from a uh, you know affordability standpoint. But 
but I think with our, with our strong pro product proposition and with, with the current plans and campaigns, I think we are making headway in all of these. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rohan, great presentation. Uh, can, can. So I, I read an article where Lego did a competition, in, I think in Norway, where they invited adults to come over and you know use Lego bricks to design houses and lots of stuff. So I was very intrigued because in many organizations, we really don't have a customer lifetime value model, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Especially in a product where you are getting your audience early on. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you have that and how, do you, how did you? Absolutely, I think that's one of our uh, big uh, uh, sort of uh, differentiating factors because we get the consumer when he or she is one and a half years old. That's the starting point for Lego Duplo. Quick advertisement for all the parents who have toddlers. Lego Duplo is the thing you need to look for in the stores next time you go. Uh, and from then on, we have uh, sort of what we call open play, open and building lines like Lego City, Lego Friends, then onwards to a bit more IP heavy, what we call like Star Wars, or, or you know, Marvel superheroes about eight, nine years of age. And then we have more complex buildings on the, what we call Lego Technic, 10 to 12 years of age. And then we have these big boxes, Lego Creator Export, Lego Technic, which are you know, basically for what we call adult fans. So there is a community called adult fan of Lego, where you know, people are crazy about, about the products and we do keep them in mind also when we design those products. With the most recent launches, uh, Bugatti, so there's a, I think one eighth the size of a Bugatti Chiron model that has just been launched. It's really iconic, really wow, and you know I've seen that there are some some people who are big fans, some CEOs who are putting it outside their office as a build-to-display model. So to your question, yes, the lifetime value is, is important, and we look and we'll keep that into consideration while we design the product and also when we go to market. Oh, sorry. Hi, hi. My name is Wei Shen. I'm from PNG. Um, <laughs> I want to ask questions um, about PNG. Um, I'm just curious. Um, I think in your examples, you did allude the the insights. Actually, a lot of times, face to face, right? Those reactions that you saw on the uh, on the on the child's on the children's um, emotions. Um, but we're also in this conference where we're also talking about digital disruption uh, in terms of insights gathering. So I'm just thinking, how, how are you? about how companies like Lego uh, about harnessing the power of um, traditional insights, so to speak, um, as well as actually digital insights. Yeah. I think it's a great question. And this is the big, uh, actually this is the biggest topic of discussion in the Khan Festival just was just ended. This is the biggest discussion that how do we balance this quantitative and qualitative piece? That's essentially what you're asking for as well. I don't think anybody has an answer. What I would say is we need to make sure we do both we need to look at this quantitative stream to see if there's any big trends that they're missing out. And then uh, they can probably tell us in which space we have to work on. Probably you can find out this is like we find, found out open, in, like first person play. Okay, fine. So that's some place where we need to be. But what exactly will we do? What exactly is the, is the activity that will work? I think that specificity probably can not come from quantitative. That has to come from a one on one or a focused uh, uh, interaction. That's my, that's my take on it. Thank you, Rohan.